My name is Susan Parkhurst and I'm a professor in the Basic Sciences Division. Um, my lab works in, in the Drosophila, which is fruit flies, experimental system. And we work uh, on two different things. One is wound healing and one is um, nuclear effects, um, cytoplasmic effects in the nucleus that affect cancer and development. You can uh, have cancer in a fruit fly? Yes, you can. Actually, fruit flies have many of the same genes as people. In fact, it's probably more disturbingly similar than you want to know. <laughs> I mean, the, the wounds heal much faster, so a wound in a, in a fly can heal in 30 minutes. So then we can do a lot of experiments very quickly, whereas in people it takes weeks. But, we, but they do it by the same mechanisms, and so we can find out a lot of the same principles and figure out how to make them go faster, better, or any of the above. Well, there are different kinds of wound healing. So there's wound healing in a single cell. That's, and, and every cell in your body undergoes wound healing. Right, and they do it um, daily, right? If you walk down a hill, you rip open muscle cells and you have to repair those because you can't replace every muscle cell. If you eat a five-star curry, your gut cells are undergoing repair. <laughs> um, so, so every day you, you, in, you have environmental and physiological things that happen to you that you have to repair, right? But then there, there's another level of, of wound repair, like if you cut yourself, and that involves multiple cells at the same time and they have to coordinate, right? And, and those kind of repairs are different. So most people are probably more, more aware of wound repair when you have cuts or burns or something, but, but cells have to do the same thing. Um, and, that, and that leads to, like for example, if you have cancer, a lot of your cells are damaged because you have cells crawling through them, they get damaged, they have to get repaired. Um, so it affects, it's affected by diseases, it's affected in normal circumstances and by things like cancer. So we can study all those different events. Um, but we, we chose to do the cell ones as opposed to, say, the, the more traditional wounding ones because people are working on those. And the other one hasn't really been studied enough to understand how to do it. But the idea is, is to be able to get to the point where you can um, affect things like diabetic people that have chronic wounds that never heal. We might be able to understand the principles and find ways to help them make it heal faster cell by cell. So if we're going to look at a lot of different proteins, we always want one thing we can compare it to so that we know that we're always looking at the same thing because we're looking at, at embryos and embryos just like people are different. Everyone's just a little bit different. So if you wanna be able to get a, a, an underlying principle, you need to know that you're looking at the same thing every time. So if we do actin plus something else, then we can always compare actin to actin to actin from time to time and then now we know how this relates to each other, right? Because we can only really image two things at a time. That's the limit of the technology right now. So if we want to compare three different things, we need to do, you know, act into the first one, act into the second one, and then we can compare the other ones by default. So actin is one of the major proteins in every cell, and it's the, the thing that gives you infrastructure, right? It's building the scaffold that gives you cell shape. It allows cells to move. It allows them to interact with the ones next to them. So it's, it's sort of the, the infrastructure that, that gives you your cell the ability to do almost anything. And it has to be dynamic because sometimes you need your cells to be rigid and do everything the same all the time. Sometimes you need them to be modal and move around. Um, so it needs to be able to regulate itself very well and adapt to anything that happens. Right? So it's a major building block of, of cell structure. Um, I had really, really good teachers in science when I, when I was growing up. And so by the time I reached high school, I knew I wanted to be in some type of science. I think at that point I thought I wanted to be a doctor because all the things I heard on TV or you know the science programs or the discovery programs or whatever it was I was doing seemed to lead more towards medicine. Um, but then by the time I got to college, I realized the part that I really liked the best was the research part of medicine. And it's very much like puzzle solving, you know, and, and it's a real challenge and I like that. So I knew, I mean, from the very beginning, that's more or less what I wanted to do. And it just got refined when I understood more like what part of it I liked the best. So in high school, I, I worked in labs. Um, and so I was able to get some experience and realize, yes, this is really what I wanted. I got to work in labs all through my college and have different experiences, which was you know, phenomenal. Um, and then went to grad school, <laughs> you know, so, and then did a, a postdoc and then eventually um, got a job here. So uh, for me, I've always worked in the same system, Drosophila, because it's a, or fruit flies, because it's a very, very, um, it's a really great model. 
there's a lot of things you can do and you can do them very fast. And I'm not a very patient person, so I always want the answer yesterday. And so that, that gives me a, a system that does that because it doesn't take very long to grow. I've been here 29 years. <laughs> nope, 29. So this drawing shows an embryo like we would have it. And this embryo actually is covered in a membrane. It's called a vitellin membrane, which is here. And we wound it right on the side here. And if I was to cut a piece straight through here and turn it sideways, it would look like this. So here's the embryo, the membrane that it's in. And we glue it to a cover slip and we image it. And when we look through the microscope, this is what we see. And if we're, if we're using a reporter, a fluorescent reporter, in this case, this is the actin, then this is what we see. It's a very well-behaved wound. The wound stays right in the middle. You can time lapse it, and then we can do all kinds of measurements and, and watch this over time and see what it does. Um, sometimes, though, your days don't go like that, and your embryos do this, right? Because they're in this vitellin membrane, and they can move around. Now, they don't usually do that, but occasionally they do. And when they do, they go all over the place like this, and it makes it really, really hard to measure it because it goes out of the plane of focus and... Um, so then you think, okay, that's, that's a waste. But in this particular case, we happen to be imaging with two colors. So a red and a green. And what we found was the following, if we looked in the, the other channel. So it told us uh, a lot about how this protein, this green protein is working and how it attaches to the embryo on the outside. And this is part of the, actually the plug of a wound. So it's the thing that plugs it when you first come, when it first opens. Um, and we would never have seen that had the embryo not moved. So sometimes what looks like it's going to be a failure turns out to be something incredible because it tells you something you never knew. So there's a, you know, a lot to be said for just watching what you get and asking what it really told you. Okay, so here's, here's if we're looking straight down on an embryo or what we call a cell, that's what we see. So it'll cycle through. Um, you see the actin ring form and it closes. And because it's time lapse, we can look at the movies, but if we want to compare one embryo to the next, it, it helps if we don't have to have two movies running simultaneously and like search between them. So what we do is we take this one and we make a strip right out of the middle and we put it here. And then we go one time point further, in this case when we wound it, and we do it. And then the next one and the next one and the next one and the next one and we get a chymograph. And this lets us see how it closes this takes 30 minutes, so we can watch that. And then if we have a mutant, we can see if it goes shorter, longer, or any of those things. We can measure a lot of parameters that way, but it lets us look at multiple ones at the same time and not have to have our, our brains looking at 10 movies simultaneously. Well, here's a wild type, and now look, and you can see really clearly like how they're different, right? And, and we can look at the movies too and go back and, you know, toggle between different time points or whatever we need to do or zoom in or so we still have that ability but this makes it much easier to compare one to another. So this is carbon dioxide and it turns out that flies will fall asleep if you put them in carbon dioxide but it's not going to hurt a person and so we can make them fall asleep on here and then we can look at them in the microscope and probably I don't know how close you can get, but you can probably do it through here. What a male and a female looks like. So their pigmentation is different. And if you turn them the other way, they look like this from the other direction. So we can, we can really easily tell the difference. So that way, if you're doing genetics and you need males and females of a particular type, you can tell which ones are which and then put them together in one of those little vials and let them go to town. So these, these are basically visible tags. So we, we have these on the same chromosome as a, as a protein we're interested in, or say a mutant protein that we're interested in. And while we can't see the mutant protein, we can see these tags. So not, it's f similar to when we're doing the imaging and we have fluorescent proteins tagging the, the, the proteins we want so we can see them as a fluorescent color imaging. This lets us in the fly see a visible marker that tells us our gene is there. So when we're doing genetics, we can tell if we're putting two different genes together, the two markers should come together, right? So we can follow it. It's basically a visible tag. Well, the one thing that I would say to anybody who asked me what, you know, how to start or what to do, and, and I would say, you know, believe in yourself and don't give up. And I mean, people are gonna help you, but no one is gonna help you as much as you help yourself. So don't be afraid to ask, don't be afraid to push. You know, if you wanna do something, push for it. 
Um, but, but be flexible because sometimes you get what you want, but it's not in the way you think. So you have to be flexible in that way, but, but don't give up. Just keep pushing for what you want because it's, science is a, not an easy profession in the sense that you have to keep pushing. A lot of times you do experiments, they don't work. And you can't give up just because they don't work. You just have to think, okay, if that didn't work, why didn't it? What else can I try? Um, what would be another way? Or even if something trivial happens, like a, equipment breaks, and you think, okay, I can't do that. How else could I do it? If, I, if that's not going to be fixed for three months, how else could I do it in the next three months? And sometimes you come up with better things. Um, so just, just always push. I'm Tessa, and I'm a research technician in the Parkhurst lab. And mostly I do imaging and um, a little bit of biochemistry, depending on the day. But mostly I come in and I image different um, fluorescent proteins and um, process my images and then that's it. <laughs> I actually had no background in microscopy um, or cell biology, but um, I am a neuroscientist by training and I needed, I needed more of a um, biochemistry and cell biology background to do what I wanted to do. Um, and so that's how I joined the lab and I've learned a lot, <laughs> but there's definitely a learning curve, but it's been worth it. <laughs> so I majored in neuroscience and actually this summer I will start a PhD in neuroscience. <laughs> I always like science the best out of all my classes. Um, in high school especially, I took AP Biology, which was one of the only APs that my school offered. I loved it. And in college, I took an intro to neuroscience class because I've always been interested in the brain and how it works. I just fell in love and I had so many questions that I just really wanted to answer. Um, and the reason that I chose research is because most of the questions that I had were not answerable. Um, there just wasn't enough research yet. And so I wanted to pursue answering some of the questions that I had. I played soccer in college. Um, but yeah, mostly in Washington, I've been exploring the mountains. Um, recently, I've gone into going to the Olympics, which are so beautiful and they're awesome. <laughs> I like the Olympics a lot. So this is our fly room. Um, and so we have empty fly food. Um, this is what we flip flies onto. This is yeast, which is what they eat. Um, and then all of these that you see are stalks. So um, these are lab stalks, which everybody uses. Um, yeah, we have a lab aide that comes in and flips all of these stalks, which is very nice. My stalks are this whole area here. <laughs> um, and so I have them labeled as different um, families of proteins that I'm looking at. Um, these are balancers, so um, just stocks to use um, to cross into different stocks. <laughs> so these aren't even part of an experiment yet. These are just tools, basically. Right. So this is what we use for our experiments. So um, in order to look at um, different proteins, like for example, we take expression. So, well, okay, so this is a membrane marker. Um, so, in order to look at this, I take these flies and I cross them to these flies. <laughs> and then um, I look at their progeny, so the next generation. Um, and those are the embryos that I image which we'll see in a bit. <laughs> and then you do that because you're looking at a specific protein you're interested in. Yes, yeah, so these are all GFP or RFP tagged. So green, green fluorescent protein or red fluorescent protein. So how often do you have to like redo the, the tubes? Once a week. <laughs> so it's actually today. Oh, yep. <laughs> so today is my stock day, so I'll spend about eight hours doing this. <laughs> One of the best experiences um, I had in college was um, studying abroad, learning a different culture, learning a different language. So I studied for one semester and then I didn't want to leave, so I extended my visa and stayed for a year. And it was a fantastic experience. I learned a new language. I have families in Ecuador that I consider part of my family. Um, and yeah, learned about a whole different culture. 
I took science classes in Spanish, which was very interesting. Um, <laughs> but also was able to take just different classes that I was interested. So I took a welding class, um, which I think is an awesome skill to have. And everybody needs to know how to weld. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it was a fantastic experience. <laughs> then I take this uh, grape plate. So this is just grape juice and agar. Um, and so the flies are attracted to the grape juice. So they lay embryos onto this plate and then I can take them. <laughs> so I put them onto the tape and um, their hard outer shell sticks to the tape and I can dissect them out, the embryo. So those are what embryos look like. <laughs> but I'll get a couple more and then we can go look at them. So in red here, we're looking at actin. So this is what an embryo looks like if you're looking at its cytoskeleton. Um, and this is our GFP protein of interest. The embryo is basically one giant cell that has multiple nuclei. Um, and then a little bit further on in embryogenesis, um, this will start to form different cells and then a fly ultimately. So what I do is I wound <laughs> embryos and I ask if these uh, proteins are important in the wound healing process. So what happens is in this um, circle, all of these squares, um, a different laser comes and punctures the, um, the membrane, creating this circular hole in the membrane. So this is just going up and down through the embryo. So we're a little bit inside of the embryo right now, but it'll wound on the surface. This is gonna sound maybe counterintuitive, but don't worry about grades. Um, I found that the classes that I did best in, I was not worried about my grades at all, and I was mostly concerned about learning. Um, and if you can really just forget about exams and really try to figure out what the material is and really just go at it at, as a learner instead of as a test taker, um, that's going to help you way more in your future and also going to get you better grades <laughs> in the meantime. But um, yeah, I think the classes that I did the best in and learned the most from, I studied material that was not going to be on the tests and asked my professors questions that weren't covered in class. Um, and so yeah, just try to learn as much as you can. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mr. Shinakamura and I'm also in the student practice run. And since I joined the, from the 2014, and usually I'm doing and a little bit of different approach using to examine the wound healing in the fly embryo. I got a PhD and a master's degree in Japan. This kind of first I don't much think about getting a PhD, so I want to go to the industry. But uh, when I start the really basic science, that's really the fun to me. And then uh, to looking at the why that happened and then thinking about that and then doing the experiment, I can get the answer. So that's a really fun to me. So I decided to get a PhD and go to the academic position. Just interested in the, the wound repair. So, and I just search the wound repair using fry and only the hit and several rub and then none of them in Japan. <laughs> and then when I came here and then when I talked to Susan and then really, she's doing a really kind of fantastic the work doing the single cell wound repair. I kind of sort of was doing the science during the high school student. I mean, it's kind of interesting the biology. But when I was a high school student, I was more interested in the more medical research and how the drug can heal the, or cure the disease and anything. But, and I just decided to go to the university doing that kind of the research. So, and then when I started, that's really more fun to me, looking at the more mechanism, why that happened, how the, the animals established their organ formation. When I think those research really 
far and they just decide oh, I should stay in academia and uh, I want to do more basic science. This is just a uh, really control the wild type embryo. So, and this is the unwounded stage and you can see really, this is the actin label. So you can see the actin is really uniformly distributed but when the wound and you can see that here, the wound and then those actin structures are disrupted and after that kind of wound that will expand but also actin start accumulating around the wound and make a nice kind of beautiful ring formation. And then this ring and the contract and the wound closes. So I just take in those uh, action dynamics and the whole the time point that free the 30 to 40 minutes. And I just measure the how fast wound did wound closing and also how much action accumulates around the wound. So I'm just analyze those data set. And then once I done those, also I can compare to the one control and whole seven mutants. But for example, that's control already making a good flashing thing, but uh, many those mutants doesn't make kind of robust action ring. Mutants have the action, but they cannot organize well. So, so in a, generally kind of those action has to be recruited to the around the wall and then kind of start assembling and they make a ring formation, but uh, these mutant fail to those assembly and or and or the recruitment action to the wound. So that's why they cannot form the really robust ring. Some of the mutants still can try to form the ring, but it's not the robust that compared to the the viral type embryo. My name is Justin. I'm a research tech here in the Parkus lab. And I primarily do wound healing, so a lot of my cross could be some biochemistry just to go along with how we look at uh, interactions with proteins during the wound healing process. I'm almost hitting about a year, so my one year anniversary is coming up. I came from Baltimore. Yeah, so I spent two years there, and then I'm actually from Canada. Where yeah. are you from in Canada? Toronto. Yeah, so it's fine. It's a little different over here in the United States. <laughs> just a little? Just a little. <laughs> So I did my undergrad actually at UBC in Vancouver in mechanical engineering. <laughs> so it's a little different than here. <laughs> yeah. So I, I decided to kind of dive into biology and the sciences because I felt like with what I know about engineering, I wanted to be playing a part in kind of the biomedical side of things and how engineering could be um, useful in biology. So I wanted to make that switch and kind of learn more about biology, how all the questions that are still yet to be answered and what I as kind of a trained engineer can think about and what I can contribute to the field. I definitely want to do my PhD. So definitely going back into bioengineering or biomedical sciences, something like that. I really enjoy the field of biology. I think there's a lot to learn and everything, every day seems to be like there's something new to read or learn or really discover ourselves. So as, as an engineer, it's, it's very cool how things work, how biology is able to have all these very intricate mechanisms and networks that really fit together. Yeah, so my, going into my PhD, I, that's kind of one of the things I want to look into, kind of cancer biology, how cancers are able to hijack normal functioning cells um, to become you know, a really fatal disease. Uh, photography, I think, is one of the things I really enjoy doing. Uh, landscapes, nature scenes, yeah. Right, this time of year, florals are definitely kind of my thing. <laughs> this is a, like a bacteria pellet right here. Um, so what we want to do is kind of put that into a solution so it'll be easier for us to kind of kill it and bring out all the DNA from that. Why would a fly lab be interested in bacteria? So we do it for a lot of the biochemistry. So, um, or we can actually make transgenics. So we would design a DNA construct and uh, grow it up in bacteria, test it to make sure it has our gene or DNA that we want. And then we can then put that back into flies. So the fly can uh, be fluorescent green or fluorescent red for uh, whatever protein that we want to tag it with. So we get to look at what that protein is doing in the fly in real time. Right, so the uh, bacteria is in a solution, so that's good. 
And then now we want to put in a, uh, a buffer which will kind of break apart the cell membrane and put the uh, DNA into the solution that we want. So for this one that we've already let sit for five minutes, uh, we have to add in a different buffer. So this one will just uh, kind of collect the DNA together so that we can filter it using one of those. It's a little slimy. So we start to mix it and then you can see the uh, there's a little bit of white goop in there. Oh, yeah. yeah. So that's the that's the cell membrane. So that's all the kind of the, the fats and the cell membrane lipids, all of those in there. And that's the stuff we don't want. So the precipitation buffer kind of brings that all out, and then the DNA is kept in the the liquid in the solution, so that we then put it through here, and it'll filter. And the DNA will get trapped uh, on the on a little membrane here on the bottom. Let's give it a little bit more. Just pour all that in. And because we're using such high volumes, we kind of just have to let it sit and let gravity really filter and pull all the all of our solution through and keep all the the things that we don't want all the cell membranes and whatever uh, in in the filter column you just take a, a quick picture before we shoot it with a laser and that'll take uh, a little bit of a depth to it and then we put a we put a target and then we hit it with a laser and hope we don't kind of poke too big of a hole. All right, so as we're taking it there, you can see there's a, there's a little bit of a hole right there where uh, we've ablated all the actin there, so it makes a wound. And then we watch kind of how the dynamics, we watch it um, close. How does the green fluorescence look? As, we, as, as it closes, um, and what we're looking here is actually a mutant. So we've actually turned off one of the genes so it doesn't produce that protein anymore. Uh, and, and that's what we're kind of looking for is what does the wound site and the closure dynamics, how does it look, how does the actin look as it's, uh, as it's closing with this one gene that's missing. And this runs, we, we like to do a time course of things. Here we want uh, we do every 15 seconds here just because we want to see how it looks and we also use uh, a little bit less of a depth so we're, uh, we're able to do a lot faster. I'm going to let this run. This one I'm going to let it go for about 15 minutes so we get to see how the wound goes from fully just wounded to closure if it closes because sometimes these mutants, they, the wound doesn't close so it stays wounded for a really long time. It doesn't go all the way to the center. It's actually kind of just the surface. Uh, usually uh, just a couple microns past the surface is where it is. So the rays is kind of a kind of a cortical flow to it. Like you have um, the embryos trying to bring actin towards the center uh, of the wound or to, to bring or not just actin, but a lot of other proteins. So that's what we think we're seeing here is with the rays. It's just the embryo is trying to bring all the proteins that it needs at the wound to fully heal. So it's actually molecules headed towards the wound, not spreading out from it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's going inward. Yeah, yeah. And there's actually uh, different analyses that we can do where we kind of track different points of the embryo as it's closing. The closure varies uh, a lot depending on what you knock down. Some of them never close. You actually see this really big hole throughout and then some of them you might actually see close faster um, but then you have some other kind of defects like 
uh, actin will just accumulate at the wound and ne never go away or yeah you have pretty much anything you can think of will happen in the embryo depending on what gene you knock down i'd say really don't be afraid to explore i think you don't you know science is very broad there's a lot of things that you can touch on uh, and just try new things, especially coming from high school. I think there's there's a lot of lot to learn, a lot to explore. So don't be afraid to just kind of dive in. Hi guys, uh, my name is Kerry Davidson. Uh, I'm currently a research technician here at Fred Hutch. As a research technician, we really have like independent projects, um, and we're able to. Um, help with writing manuscripts, um, contribute to grant writing and things like that. Um, so it's been a really good um, career starter, Kickstarter for me, I think. So I have been here for about a year and a half. Yeah, it's yeah about a year and a half now. <laughs> I um, went to undergrad at Princeton University um, and I graduated in 2019. Um, and I majored in molecular biology there. Um, and so I went in actually freshman year, I knew I wanted to do molecular biology, um, but I explored a bit um, by taking various different classes. Like some of my favorite classes to this day are like art history classes, which has nothing to do with biology. But actually uh, Princeton actually had a program um, the summer before I started for first generation low income students. Um, so I'm a first gen student um, and that was really eye-opening for me because in that first summer, I started off in a molecular biology lab. I was working with C. elegans, which are like little worms. Um, and I found it super cool because we were looking at different genes and we were like using these like little worms. Um, and they like when we disrupted certain genes, um, they had different phenotypes, which means they were acting or they're behaving in a different way. And I thought it was quite amazing that we could use this like simple C. elegans um, to think about how um, certain genes are affecting us as human beings. Um, and so that was kind of where my interest in molecular biology really began. And um, going through college, I ended up majoring in molecular biology, but I graduated and felt like I didn't quite know what direction I wanted to go. I was interested in medicine, so I was pre-med while in college. But I kind of wanted to figure out what the next few years, <laughs> five to 10 years of my life would look like. Um, and so before deciding that I wanted to go to grad school or medical school, I decided to start as a research technician. Um, and a research technician, I think, just really gave me the opportunity to really delve into science for a brief amount of time, right? But I'm, I'm full time um, and really figure out, is this what I see myself doing um, for the rest of my life, really? Um, and it is. I really love what I do. I love um, being in the lab. Um, and I think my job is very much like a puzzle every day, right? It's like putting together different pieces of puddles, puzzle, and sometimes you do something and realize it doesn't quite fit. <laughs> and you might have to shape it a bit more, or you might have to go back and try again, but then eventually I find a place for it to fit. And I, I, I love that aspect of, of my work. I grew up as an only child um, to my two parents who immigrated to the UK. So I'm actually from the UK, I'm from South London. My parents were very, very hardworking. Uh, they had to be having immigrated to the UK, so they immigrated from the Caribbean islands. They always um, got me involved in whether it was sport, I became a track, track and field athlete. And so they always encouraged me to get involved in things and on the academic side too. My mum was always my go-to for math problems. My dad was for like my English homework because um, that was that kind of their specialties in, in high school. Um, and so, you know, being a first gen student, I think it's been a great experience and a great journey because while I wasn't exposed to a lot of things like science, right, when I was younger, um, it, it made me a bit more inquisitive and a bit more curious when it came to the classroom, right? And when it came to speaking to teachers or professors in college, I was always, uh, always interested in what they had to say because I kind of never experienced it growing up or, you know, I didn't have anyone in my family that was a scientist or, or in the medical field or anything. I went to high school in the UK and then uh, went, to, went to Princeton more so because of track. I ended up being recruited and so I kind of wanted to keep traveling a bit more. I hadn't been to the West Coast um, before and I said, hey, I'm, I'm doing this kind of two year period where I'm trying to figure out what I want to do in the future. Um, why not go somewhere you haven't been before? <laughs> and so I came over to the West Coast um, and Fred Hodge kind of stood out to me um, when, I was, when I was speaking to Dr. Parkhurst, really because 
I was interested in um, doing basic science to connect that to disease biology and understanding human development and human disease. Um, and it was really what brought me into science in the first place. And so I liked how Fred Hutch kind of was um, an, uh, an unit to be able to do that. You have your basic science labs here, you have your clinical labs um, in other areas of Fred Hutch, but then also you have the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, which is on the, which is on the same campus. Um, and you know, pre-COVID I was, I was um, fortunate enough to be able to volunteer for a bit at Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. So I really liked that at Fred Hutch you could connect I could be in a basic science lab, right, looking at cells, and then uh, <laughs> during the week I could also go over to SCCA and be working with patients who are affected by these diseases, um, and that's really motivating for me. Um, it motivates me to come back to the lab and push even harder to, to find answers. I love being able to see the microscopic and the macroscopic, and that's, that's why I have an interest in, in medicine and connecting basic science um, to medicine as well because basic science for me is the microscopic okay this is what it's happening here in the cells but then how does that affect the human body overall and so for me the motivator is is going out there and seeing that there are people that are, are suffering that have diseases um, there there is inequity um, in the world there is injustices going on in the world and there's a small part that I can do in this one area and so that's what kind of brings me back into the loop of things when things don't go super well. <laughs> so I was recently accepted into an MD-PhD program, um, which is amazing. So what that means is that I'm going to um, be getting a degree in, in medicine, so I'll become a doctor of medicine, but also a doctor of science, a PhD. It's about a seven to eight year process, <laughs> um, but I'm really looking forward to it because uh, I, as I mentioned, it's connecting basic sciences. Um, I love the fact that we can look at sea elegans, we can look at flies, right? I used to work with zebrafish at one point, um, and we can use them as tools um, to figure out um, disease and to figure out why um, some people are suffering the way that they are health-wise. How do we how do we make people healthier? There are different stages of fly development, um, and so it starts off as an embryo, which you might have seen um, with with Tessa. Um, and then it gets a bit older and it becomes larvae. And so these are these like little worm-like structures. Um, they kind of remind me of um, C. elegans a bit. Um, and so I dissect the glands out of these. So the glands are kind of in their, in their right stage when the flies are specifically third instar larvae. And that's when we like to look at them. And so then what I do is I just take out one of those larvae that I showed you earlier. And I usually just put them on to the glass slide here. A lot of a lot of science ends up being, you know, you kind of read about a particular dye or a particular company comes out with a new way in which we might be able to look at things. And you kind of try it out and see if it works for your tissue. Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. Um, so you get to play. Yeah, you definitely get to play around a bit. And I think, I think that's a really nice thing about um, when it comes to when it comes to science. There's also, I think, people don't realize like, how much reading you also have to do around certain subjects and like reading past literature um, or reading up when people come out with certain things. Um, and you when when you read something cool you might say hey i want to try this and you get to play a bit this is what a gland uh looks like um and so in red here is actin and so actin is just outlining um the cell cortex and so these this, this is like these are individual like cells if you want making up the salivary gland and in green here is lamin gfp and so gfp is a gluten fluorescent protein um, which fluoresces um, when we excite it with a particular type of light. Lamin is um, just found in nuclei, underlies the inner nuclear membrane. It was hard for me to see myself uh, as a scientist or as a doctor because there weren't necessarily a lot of people that I knew in my life that, that were in those um, positions um, or just that looked like me, right, in those positions. And so I think one thing I would tell myself is that um, 
whatever it is out there that you're passionate about or that you are interested in or that you even just want to try out. Um, there may not be people that look like you or identify um, the way that you do, um, but you do have a place there and you do belong. Um, eventually, um, you will find someone like yourself that you connect with. And even if you don't, um, there are so many great mentors out there that have helped me along the way to get to where I'm at. Um, and I'm, I'm very I'm very introverted so I, I struggle to kind of reach out to people um, and networking is like not my favorite thing to do um, and I get that <laughs> um, but I think when you when you really bond well with someone even if it's that's one science teacher or even one English teacher um, you know it's nice to kind of get to know their life trajectory and how they got to where they are and it helped me um, oftentimes figure out what directions would be best for me to go by just pushing myself to have those in-depth conversations.